Okay, welcome to the Public Domain Comics panel. Uh, we're going to talk about Sherlock Holmes, Mickey Mouse, and many, many other subjects as it pertains to uh, Public Domain Comics. And I've got uh, the four of us here for the panel. Um, would you like to introduce yourselves? Let's start with Mr. Mason. Oh, hi, I'm uh, Tom Mason. I was the creative director for Malibu Comics, and I put together a lot of the public domain material uh, that Malibu published. And uh, Michael? Uh, Michael Lovitz. I'm an intellectual property attorney here in uh, West Hollywood and uh, have a particular fondness for characters and character rights. And how long have you done panels at San Diego Comic-Con? So for, uh, for non-pandemic years, I've been doing uh, <laughs> my comic book law school series of panels uh, for uh, the past 27 years. There you go. And last but not least, Mr. Barry Gregory. Hi, Barry. I'm, hey, I'm, uh, I'm Barry Gregory. I'm the, uh, the publisher and uh, writer at uh, Gallup Comics. We, uh, we, we focus on uh, updated, reimagined versions of public domain superheroes. Yay! And my name is Dave Aldrich. Uh, I was the publisher at Malibu Comics, and Tom and I worked together putting out lots and lots of either pu either existing public domain material or reimagining um, public domain material the same way that Barry does. So um, I'm going to go, I think, uh, back to the um, screen share so that everybody can see the visuals, and uh, we can talk about some of this stuff. Um, so there's the beginning, and there's a list of us in case anybody needs to record that information for posterity, or they are deaf and they can't hear me. Um, and then let's start with, with talking about um, some of the pitfalls and um, benefits of um, reproducing historical material um, as is. So at Malibu, we did Sherlock Holmes, we did Charlie Chan, we did a, a number of other things. Um, and we were able to use the names because the names were also included in the, the package of what was in public domain. What's your, what's your memory of bringing this stuff um, back, Tom, and our, the process we went through? Well, almost all of this stuff um, originated with a guy named Bill Blackbeard, who was a comic strip collector and ran what was called the San Francisco Academy of Comic Art, I think is what that's called. Um, and he, he either bought collections of newspapers or clipped them out himself and over the years, and he built up this giant library of all of these strips in order. And he was always looking for an outlet to get them published so that they could be seen by a new audience and that he could also make some cash. And so he provided the when it turned out we needed, um, I think Barry might appreciate this, in publishing, you need a certain level of uh, books on your schedule to create cash flow. And so when, in order to get up to speed on a number of books, um, it's really easy if Bill Blackbeard sends you a giant stack of comic strips and you just take stats of them and uh, put them in comic book format. It's a lot easier than trafficking an entire book. And so um, that's how we got the run of the Sherlock Holmes stuff. I think he, Bill had the entire run of the strip with the exception of two missing strips. And so we were able to get, I think 24 or 28 issues out of that, out of that run. And the same with Charlie Chan. He had all the Alfred Andreola strips in consecutive order. And right. I would just like I would just like to point out that the uh, uh, one of the the things about uh, uh, well we'll get to that in a second but the uh, <laughs> okay oh I'm I'm jumping ahead by a slide and I really shouldn't ah I see. um so the the coloring on the the covers are are artwork pulled from uh, panels of the strips and that's uh, been recolored by Scott Beezer, the Sherlock Holmes one and the Charlie Chan one is recolored by uh, Bruce Tim, the animation director. Right, the guy that uh, brought Batman the Animated Series to life, which yes. was coloring some of our covers back then. Yes, and this was obviously before he became Bruce Tim, when he was just Bruce. Right, sure. <laughs> and Michael, there's some interesting aspects to us publishing Sherlock Holmes, because when we did it, the, the strips were public domain, but there was a uh, person representing the estate who said that we had to pay them some nominal fee which 
was not prohibitive, but what was the deal with that and how has it changed? So it's, it's interesting, and, and Dave, you might not know this about my, uh, my work background, but when I was a young attorney in uh, my third or fourth year of practice, I started uh, working as in-house counsel for Rick Marshall at Remco Books. And, and Rick at that time was involved in the reprinting of uh, public domain comic strips such as um, uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland, Crazy Cat, Terry and the Pirates. And one of the, one of the problems he ran into when he was doing these books um, is, is probably related to, to the issue here. And that was, he was doing the Terry and the Pirates series of books and the syndicate reached out and sent him a cease and desist letter. And Rick was insistent, no, we've researched these. These are all public domain strips. We're, we're perfectly within our right to reproduce them. And the syndicate's position was, whether that's true or not, and we don't necessarily agree with it, your use of the Terry and the Pirates logo on the front cover of your book infringes our trademark in Terry and the Pirates. Right, sure, yeah. Trade, trademark is a, is a, is, can be a real, um, yeah, it can be a real quicksand thing for people trying to reproduce um, public domain materials, for sure. So, so we were involved in negotiations and, and finally reached an, an accommodation with the syndicate to allow for the reproduction of what we still believed at the time to be public domain strips, uh, but it required changing the logo in such a way as to not be identical to their current logo, um, because our argument, of course, was it's fair use to sure. <laughs> call it Terry and the Pirates, because what else do you call Terry and the Pirates? Right. <laughs> other than its title. Right. Um, so, so it really en ended up becoming more of a nuance of the type font and the sizing and the coloring and things like that. So it was different than what they were currently using. So the, the uh, Conan Doyle estate similarly might have been running up against an issue. Um, and and I'm, this, this is going to be a longer answer than you need, but the problem, <laughs> the problem with the public domain in the United States was under the U.S. Copyright Act of 1909, which was in place through uh, the end of 1977, there were certain um, formalities that needed to be met in order for something to have copyright protection. That included putting a notice on all copies that were sold, saying copyright, whatever the year was, and the name right. of the copyright owner. It had to be on every single um, uh, product that was sold, every item. Um, and you had to register with the Copyright Office within X number of years, and you had uh, protection only for 28 years, renewable for an additional 28 years. So if you didn't renew it, it went into the public domain. So if you didn't put notice, if you didn't put notice on every single copy, if you didn't register or if you didn't renew, then it would enter the public domain. And the problem was, in 1976, the U.S. joined what's referred to as the Berne Convention, which is an international copyright convention. And under the Berne Convention, one of the guidelines says, uh, in order to be a member here, you have to grant to people from other countries in the same rights in your country that they would enjoy in their country. Right. And so now you have someone like a uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle come along and under the UK rules, copyright was not limited to 28 plus an additional 28. It was lifetime, the lifetime of the author plus 50 years, later extended to plus 70 years. And so now you would have this conflict once the US joined the Berne Convention, you would have to be able to give the Conan Doyle estate the same length of protection for their writings and their characters that they would enjoy in England here in the US. And so um, in this instance, I think what, what tended to happen was the estate, uh, through a combination of their uh, non-US copyrights and their trademarks, has for a long time been able to uh, operate a licensing program. And that licensing program, as you just said, reasonable, not, not a very expensive uh, license to take in order to be able to use the name on the cover. Right. And, right. Um, and partly, again, because they're up against a fair use issue. Sure. It's, it's, if, if the, the, the 
Sherlock Holmes strips are in the public domain, what else do you call Sherlock Holmes strips? <laughs> right. Um, and so by getting just this tiny little revenue stream, but once you add it up across all the different product lines and, and things, uh, you can see that there would be a robust licensing program there. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's really all that Dame Jean Conan Doyle was asking for. She said that you can use the Sherlock Holmes name without any problems whatsoever. Give me a hundred bucks and put my name with this wording on the inside front cover. Sure. And, and there's that, the added benefit, not just because, you know, well, I, I needed that hundred dollars. No, they, they, they didn't really need that money. But if you licensed it, then the next person they go to, they get to say, look, these other people took a license. Right. You, you right. should take a license also. And then it snowballs and snowballs and the licenses get bigger and bigger, especially when you start hitting television and movies. And right. That, that was the impression that we got too, that uh, the small time comic book publisher would happily part with $100 in order to set the stage for the big time movie people to pay $100,000 or $10,000 or whatever. Exactly. Okay. So, and then we were also, we also produced um, The Uncensored Mouse, which has sort of become a legendary book because we only got to do two issues of it before the nice lawyers at Disney came knocking. And those were actually Mickey, public domain Mickey Mouse strips. But we also published some Mickey, some, uh, some public domain strips, newspaper strips of the shadow but we had to call it crime classics and there's a good reason for that right tom right because uh, and i forget uh, barry probably knows this kind of history better um is i think street and smith originally owned the shadow uh publishing rights back in the pulp era and i forget who picked those up when street and smith sold out i think it was condé nast but yes. the trademark yeah okay thanks the trademark to the shadow is still a valid trademark and unlike the Sherlock Holmes people they would not settle for a hundred dollars <laughs> so our our precedent with Sherlock Holmes did not equal a precedent with uh, Condé Nast and so um, the rules were that we could call it whatever we wanted to call it and we could use the shadow name but the shadow name could not look like the shadow logo and it could not be larger than the logo for the title of the book and we could not do new shadow artwork. The actual artwork on the cover is um, based on a blown up image from the strip. And it's painted by Bruce Tim. Yeah, you can see, and you just, can see Bruce logo right there. Bruce's signature right there. That's, that's, yeah. I noticed that. Yeah, you so got you know, the cover. He liked it because he liked to paint in this sort of pulpy uh, field. Um, and so um, he would just drop out the black line. But right. uh, that's that's the original Vernon Green artwork that's been heavily overpainted by Bruce. Right. And then the same thing with the mouse. There's ob obviously we couldn't use a Mickey Mouse name, um, but mouse is not a um, a trademarked word, and so uh, we just picked a font that is sort of uh, Disney esque without being a Disney font, and and then we didn't we deliberately did the all black cover so as not to use any sort of image of mickey to sort of lessen the anger that we knew was coming sure yeah i'm surprised i'm, I'm surprised that the the shadow folks at the time allowed you to use such a prominent image of the character and always applauded when i was younger and and a, and a collector and saw the uncensored mouse for sale in comic book stores always <laughs> applauded the the approach that you took there because there is no argument from a trademark perspective that you're infringing on the name, the image, the likeness, any of those things where Disney could raise a ruckus right. um, for, for marketing purposes. So, so, so why, that, do you think their, why do you think their lawyers sent us a letter then and told us to stop, Michael? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite sure it's, it's similar to the same reason that Disney lawyers have, have issues with people uh, dealing with Song of the South and why there's currently such a a big hullabaloo about uh, possibly forcing, trying to force Disney to redo Splash Mountain. And that is uh, the, the house that the mouse built has real sensitivities when it comes to the family friendly nature of certain characters and certain elements. And Mickey Mouse is one of those. And 
the contents of these strips. I mean, there was a reason they didn't, they didn't. Uh, you mean this come. stuff? Is this the stuff they might've objected to? Yeah, probably. Mickey threatening wildlife with a, a giant gun and uh, these lovely natives carrying him around as the king? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, not, not quite the squeaky clean, pardon the pun, um, <laughs> image that Mickey Mouse. <laughs> currently uh is, is is shown to have so but ultimately tom the reason we couldn't do it was there was two strips that we published or put in the book that were still covered somehow isn't that yeah so what ended up happening so i don't know how deep if you want to go back to the previous uh slide um with the covers there we go you can see we 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 never even used mickey mouse or disney we used floyd godfordson who is not even he doesn't have a trademark um but the uh um so the deal is that, and we went back and forth with Bill Blackbeard about this forever because, oh, and by the way, hi, Barry. I realize you haven't talked in like an hour. <laughs> yeah, hi, dude. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Well, I, I guess we'll get to Barry soon enough. Well, if he um, wants to speak up, I invite him to chime in whenever he likes. Um, I, if, go if, ahead. No, I, it, 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 if, I, if I had something worthy to add, I, I would certainly speak up, but I, okay, I'm okay. enjoying the conversation. Uh, I, I promise I'll shut up soon. Um, and so, I, I can't make the same promise. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> and so um, Blackbeard came to us and he said, um, and again, this gets pretty deep. Um, and he said, how would you guys like to publish Mickey Mouse? I have all these public domain comic strips. And we just laughed it off like, no way. No, because we, we know where this goes, Bill. And he said, no, no, no I've, got, I've got all the strips and I've got all the copyright information and these strips are definitely public domain. Here's all the paperwork. And we kept telling him, well, you know, Mr. Blackbeard, with all due respect, Disney's lawyers don't really care. We're a really small publishing company and they're really angry Disney lawyers and just, you know, even, probably even mentioning it, a lawyer would show up at our door. And we went back and forth and back and forth about doing it or not doing it. And we finally decided to do it only with the caveat that uh, Scott Rosenberg, the president, would have to agree to take all the phone calls and answer all the letters. That Dave and myself and Chris Holm did not want to talk to any Disney lawyers for any reason and didn't want to open up any mail. And so, is that? Go ahead. All right. And it, so, <laughs> am I going ahead or are you going ahead? You're going. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> and so. Um, we, when we published it, we did two issues in the first month and we probably should have done four just so we could get four of them out. Um, we got, yep, the, we, we, got the cease, we got the cease and desist letter from Disney. Uh, the two issues were already gone. Um, and Disney um, did not threaten to sue, did not take us to court, did not make us really pay anything. Um, they just wanted it stopped because in addition to the issues that Michael mentioned earlier, um, all of the strips with the exception of one or two, were actually in the public domain. And that was the thing they were also trying to keep secret. Um, they didn't want anything to get out that was something they didn't have control over anymore. And but they wanted have, proof they were protecting it, even though they didn't have any right to. So. Right. And then yeah. it turned out that there is, at some point, and Blackbeard didn't have this information, at least one, probably two of the original strips had been reprinted in something else and had been copyrighted then. So those two strips were actually not in the public domain. And that right. was the, the, the tricky legal loophole that um, made our claim sort of invalid. So then we agreed to, um, uh, to stop publishing. Um, we kept all the money from the two issues. And then a couple of years later, when I had a pitch meeting at Disney and I was no longer working for Malibu, the guy I was pitching to realized that I was one of the people who did the uncensored mouse. And he asked me if I could slip him a couple of copies because he didn't have any. Oh, that's awesome. So it's actually kind of surprising that, that they didn't maintain copyrights on these things for that very reason. If you want to control something and keep it away from the public, then maintain your monopoly. Uh, yes. It's, it's somewhat, uh, like I said, puzzling to me that they wouldn't have kept the copyright valid and, and allowed it to lap into the public domain. But renew, yeah. renewing copyrights on old newspaper strips is old man's work, and they're just not interested in, you know, courting old men, you know what I'm saying? Who's, who's going to listen to us? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> 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 so, 
so we also we also did some old slave girl stuff. We also did I Love Lucy. We did um, Buck Rogers, which we called Cosmic Heroes for the same reason we did the shadow thing. Um, I just need a couple quick an anecdotes on those, Tom, so that we okay. can move on. So um, I Love Lucy, we actually paid a small license to get the I Love Lucy name because otherwise it's... I was going to ask. <laughs> yes, because otherwise it's... Um, you run into a problem of what do you call it? And it's just easier to... Because it was old comic strips and because they were in the public domain, it was a really good, it was not a prohibitive deal. It was kind of like the Sherlock Holmes deal. Cosmic Heroes with Buck Rogers was um, the same deal as The Shadow. The Three Stooges, we actually licensed the name because um, Norman Maurer, who had drawn the original Stooges comic strips or comic book pages that we were reprinting, was actually a family friend of Scott Rosenberg. And Scott wanted to maintain even though they were public domain, Scott didn't want to go to family gatherings and run into Norman and have it be uncomfortable and awkward. Sure. Um, and then with, with Private Eyes, um, we made an arrangement with uh, the creator of The Saint, Leslie Charteris. Um, what else is on? I, I can't see. Uh, it's all right. We, we're, 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 we're filling up our time nicely, boys. No, I'm sorry. I, oh, I'm no, no, that's me. good. That's what, that's what we're here for, to deal all out right. all this lovely information. Um, but we also did, in addition to reprinting stuff that existed, we also took um, properties that already existed and made new material about them. And this is more along the lines of what Barry did, but Malibu did it um, with lots and lots of properties. Frankenstein, The Three Musketeers, War of the Worlds, Dracula. Um, they just went on and on and on and on. Everything that wasn't nailed down, we were, we were pretty much repurposing if we could. And that, that was part of a, a different publishing program idea because the, right. the two sure. Frankenstein, Dracula, all that stuff. We thought we had an, uh, an avenue into bookstores uh, because we had hired a, an actual book person um, to sort of push these things into bookstores. And all we had to do was do a three or four issue miniseries, collect it as a trade paperback, and she would help push it into libraries and bookstores. But of course at the time we were doing this, we forgot the key part of that, which is libraries were all like, what's, what is this stuff? We don't know what this is. This is not what we're, now it's different. But back then it was, right. it was like an alien. But, but that's why we kept picking stuff we knew librarians would know the name of. Yes. To create comic books so that we could have a trade paperback. They'd go, oh, I know what Frankenstein is. I know what three, three, three Musketeers is. So when they got it in their hands, they sort of knew what to do with it as opposed to, if we t did a trade of one of our existing comics, well, like the Men in Black, retail comic or, um, librarians and bookstore people wouldn't know what to do with it way back right. when. And this is this is all stuff that uh, people need to be able to keep in mind if they're dealing with public domain properties. As is and and the list that you had shown of things that you did, including the Three Stooges and I Love Lucy, and you know the stories about the Shadow is. Even when stuff has entered to the, in the public domain, um, the the rush to trademark is sometimes something to keep an eye on because having something having something that you can protect through branding uh, helps give you a leg up in certain instances. You just have to be uh, mindful that you you can't necessarily get a trademark in in something that is what it is. I don't know that you can that you can get a, a trademark for Romeo and Juliet because you typed out your version of Romeo and, I mean, you're on your computer, word for word, the, the original version of Romeo and Juliet. I don't know that you can stop others from being able to use Romeo and Juliet to, uh, to market their, their editions of right. Romeo and Juliet. But, when you, but you, when you take something and you reimagine it for modern times or, um, or even if all you're doing is adding the art, then, then you're adding something to that and, and giving yourself something to hang your hat on from that trademark perspective. Um, it's also important for people to remember that when you do take something like War of the Worlds and you just do your version, um, yes, you'll get copyright protection in your version, but it's, it's limited. It's only the new things that you've added. And that, that can be substantial if you're taking something that was only in prose and suddenly you're, you're making a comic book version because all the illustrations, all, all of that stuff is new and, and protectable under copyright. But 
it doesn't give you the right to stop someone else from doing the exact same thing in their vision. Right. So what right. you're what you're saying, Michael, for people who are listening to this program because they're thinking about doing um, repurposing of public domain stuff themselves, what you're saying is if you took War of the Worlds and you redesigned the Martians, your design of the Martians would still be protected. If Could be. If, Could it's, be. if it's not if it's not too much like the others, right? Right, like you can't you can't watch the Tom Cruise movie and then say, "Oh, I'm going to do a comic book version using that look for the aliens." Right. Or I'm going to use I'm going to use the um, Mars Attacks version of Martians. Sure. But in a world world the world setting, which actually would be kind of a fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's let's do that. That I mean that. Right. So yeah, as long as you're not copying from what's already out there. If you come up with something new and interesting, yes, that's that's where your protection right. could lie. And now we're going to get to public domain superheroes, and we um, tripped over the centaur characters. And Tom, did did R. A. Jones bring this to us? Did we discover it? What's the origins of us like deciding to take the protectors characters and do our own spin? It comes from. Um... You know, I have forgotten where the idea to use the centaur characters actually came from. I know that once the centaur idea was hit upon, we hired Ron Goulart, the historian and science fiction author, to go into his archives. And he wrote up uh, one page uh, historical biographies of all the centaur characters that he could. So like 20 of them or something like that. Right. And that would give us enough background to sort of pick and choose um, what could be what which ones were just too stupid to use anymore which ones obviously needed different names which ones backstories were historically problematic given the times <laughs> right um, sure. yeah. and so um and then we just sort of we sort of picked into like the the guy here in the on the pink flap is renamed gravestone that's a reworking of a character with the stupidest name ever called the phantom of the fair right and that's <laughs> So I was and, I was really proud of the gravestone name. I, I, that was yes. that was some of my best work. And uh, the and the protector's name was not a centaur name. That's a Malibu name. So that goes right. back to what Michael was saying about creating your own brand with the reimagined characters. And I think the ferret was an existing character, and the arrow was an existing character. Yep, that's all so. true. The interesting thing is, this is sort of where Barry Gregory comes in. Finally, <laughs> I can I can you know, shut up now. Because so some of he, some of my he, earliest free, some of my earliest freelance work was actually on the uh, some of the some of those Malibu titles there. Oh, really? Uh, what did what, what did yeah, you do? I worked, what did you I worked them? on the. I did some. I did some. I did coloring mostly. Okay. I did some coloring on the gravestone, and then uh, some of the protectors as well, I believe. Because your your friends are the Roland Man. Right? right and Roland, because Roland didn't he bring you in because he was the editor? Yeah, he brought me in to do the coloring because I lied to him and told him I could do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't but, laugh. That's a honor, a finely honored comic book <laughs> tradition. But uh, so so yeah, I, I got the I got my first assignment. I think it was an issue of Gravestone, and then I had to give myself a real crash course on how to actually color a comic. And Michael, briefly, from a a maybe I want to be a publisher perspective, what are the major pitfalls? And Barry, you can talk to this too about taking characters that have existed in the past and like, what do you have to, what, what do you definitely may, want to make sure that you do? And what do you want to make sure you avoid doing? Does that make sense? Sure. Well, certainly, certainly what you want to avoid doing is taking anything that's been um, revived and trademarked. Uh, by way of example, there's a group of golden age superheroes that entered the public domain. Um, characters uh, like Zeus and um, Zeus, uh, <laughs> and, wow. uh, the Green Llama and Black Terror and uh, those types of 40s heroes, 40s and 50s heroes. And dynamite uh, a number of years Miss, back. Miss, Miss Fury. Miss Fury. There, I mean, what, isn't dynamite relaunching Miss Fury right now? I mean, yeah. Malibu did it. Now dynamite's Absolutely. doing it again. Yeah. Absolutely right. Uh, with uh, 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 a new graphic novel that they're currently, I think, Indiegogo. 
yep. uh, fundraising for. So those, those characters were in the public domain and all of those trademarks, to the extent they existed 50 years ago, lapsed. And so working with Alex Ross, they came up with a new, uh, a new approach to those characters, modernizing them, bringing them into the you know, 21st century, and they created their Project Superpowers line of books, um, where you've got the death-defying devil because they can't use Daredevil. <laughs> right. <laughs> since Marvel has a new Daredevil character. Um, so that's an example. They took a character that had a recognizable name, modified the name, and then got protection for that. So, you know, so, so those are, but those are things you need to be careful of, mindful of, is that other people can have, can have rights. Um, you also, to the extent that anyone else has modernized a character, and, and uh, the Green Llama is one that comes to mind because I think three or four different publishers in the last 20 years have done things with the Green Llama, either under sure. license from the original estate uh, or on their own. And so to the extent that you decide, hey, we're going to include Green Llama in this project, Superpowers, you have to make sure that what you're taking from is the original work, the thing that's actually in the public domain. And, and we talked about Sherlock Holmes before, and one of the interesting things was that there was a case uh, just a few years ago involving whether or not Sherlock Holmes was in the public domain because sufficient time had passed. And there was a, 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 an attorney, he wasn't an IP attorney, he was just, I think he was a family law attorney uh, named Leslie Klinger. And he was a huge Sherlock Holmes fan and started working on an anthology where he would have uh, current writers come up with new stories involving Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, you know, all the familiar things. And um, initially, he got a license for the first volume, but for the second volume, he said, no, this is all public domain. Sherlock Holmes entered the public domain because the first novel was more than uh, right. plus, plus 70 years prior. Um, they actually got involved in a, a major lawsuit that went up to the Seventh Circuit it was appealed to the Supreme Court, but they declined. And basically, the, the court said, no, when these first novels were finished and completed, the character existed. And so the character itself had entered the public domain. To the extent that there were new stories, because the argument from the estate was uh, that there were stories in the 30s that, that were continuing the character, and therefore the copyright shouldn't end until the, the anniversary of those stories being published. Um, the court basically came back and said, no, the characters in the public domain, those elements that we're familiar with were in the public domain. The only thing that was protected by those later stories are new elements that you added. Right. You know, because the estate argued, oh, well, he was a drug addict in those later stories, and we learned about you know, Dr. Watson got married, and, and so that changed the characters. And the, the court said, well, to the extent there are new elements added, those could be protected, but otherwise it's in the public domain. So similarly here, if you're working with characters, uh, comic strips, whatever, that, that are public domain, and you're trying to revitalize them, you want to make sure that you're working from material that's actually in the public domain and avoid anything that was added uh, in the year since. Right. And this is where the whole uh, discussion sort of overlaps one on top of each other, because the protectors had a, had a character that was based on Centaur's Amazing Man, and Barry's got a character that's based on Centaur's Amazing Man, so I thought putting them side by side would be a nice thing. So what's your take on all of this, Mr. Barry, Mr. Mr. Amazing Man? Well... <laughs> We, when we did, uh, when we decided to do John Amon, I, we tried to we tried to keep his look as as similar to the original as possible. I knew I was going to diverge quite a bit uh, from the original with the story that I was telling. It was it, we pretty much just took the name and the and the look. Um, actually, the, the the very first book that we that we published, uh, I left him without the pants. You know, he had he had bare legs. And I remember somebody walked by our table and said, amazing man, more like low self-esteem man. And 
<laughs> and I, 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 had, I had been debating put giving him pants from the very beginning. And I'm like, that's, that's the final straw. So my connection to the character is I put him in pants. Um, or, or my contribution to the character is I put him in pants. Right. Um, you know, I, honestly, I had forgotten that he was in the protectors at the time that I, that, uh, that I started working on this, on this series. Actually, it was, I think it was Roland Mann that reminded me he was in the protectors. And uh, I went back and, and looked through my issues and I'm like, ah, sure enough, he was there. I just didn't make that connection. If um, somebody else wanted to go down the path you've gone down, Barry, what advice would you give them about, I mean, you must have learned a ton of stuff you weren't expecting to learn. Yeah. Um, well, I, 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 I intentionally tried to focus on, on really obscure characters. Uh, uh, characters that for the most part I, nobody else would have wanted so I, that's how I, I tried to avoid any potential trademark or, or copyright issues is just John Amon's probably a little more high profile than than I was originally thinking but w once I started coming up with ideas for it I couldn't let it go but you know Biff Stone Monster Hunter for Hire appeared for a total of eight pages in 1951 I think so uh you don't get much more obscure than that. The, uh, the character that we call Miniature Man began life with the, the really unfortunate name of Mini Midget the Miniature Man. And, uh, that, is, that is unfortunate. Yeah, so it was, we, we, we dropped that part and, and, and kept the Miniature Man. But again, it was, a, it was a character that had pretty much been forgotten by history. All um, right, so we're about three to six minutes away from being done. I'm going to um, let that sit on the screen for a second. Uh, Michael, what would you say in summary about um, people that either want to um, reprint existing materials or revive new materials in terms of, you know, the, maybe the big don't or the big do? Well, the big, the, the big thing that people really have to be mindful of is, is doing a thorough and complete search as to whether or not something actually is in the public domain. There, there are all kinds of horror stories about uh, people who believe something to be in the public domain and move forward and spend a lot of time and effort and money in, in gearing up for production only to find out that, oh, wait a minute, it wasn't first published in the US, it was actually published in, in uh, France first and under French law, it's not in the public domain. And oops, um, I really, I really can't do what I was just about to do without some sort of license or permission. Um, and and other than that, just you know, making sure to, if you're not just slavishly reprinting what's already been done, uh, just be mindful of, of anyone else who's ever done anything with it. it would, you look at Frankenstein as as the classic example where the book is in the public domain and you wouldn't be you wouldn't you would be surprised by how many people want to depict Frankenstein with bolts on his neck without realizing that that's not part of the original material that's part of the universal films and they right. still have protection for that yeah. and and they they have a lot of ex disney lawyers in their <laughs> office exactly they love sending out those <laughs> What 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 do you what do you, what you what do you got to say for yourself, Mr. Tom? Here in summary, before we go, uh, I got nothing. I'm more interested in in two things. I know Barry's got the Funny Man book coming up. Oh yeah, no, I do want to hear about domain. that. I do want to okay. hear about that before we run out of time. And um, I want to ask Michael if he has a book. Do I have a book? Yes. Have you published a book that with all this good good advice that you've given? Back back in back in the year 2000 through uh, through Sirius which was a publisher uh, that's, that's no longer with us, unfortunately. I did put out a, a comic book. It was called the Trademark and Copyright Book. Okay. And it, uh, it's got some basics for, for creators on copyright and trademark law and understanding both. And I continue to work on revisions for that. And I'm in touch with the original artist. And we keep hoping that we'll do a more expanded version of that. Okay. Nice. So I, beyond my two questions, I got nothing. I'd rather hear from Barry. Me too. Tell us about Funny well, Man. Um, Funny Man is a, a, a series that I'm kickstarting right now. It's, it's based on a character created by Siegel and Schuster. 
Uh, it was one of their, their big follow-ups to Superman. Uh, it was originally published by Magazine Enterprises, I think, in 1948, I believe, was when they, when they published it. Ran for uh, uh, five or six issues, as I recall. Um, it, they based it on, on, on Danny Kaye and uh, just put him in a clown suit and, uh, and he, he fought crime uh, as, as a, as a non-powered superhero. So I, I love, I love the look of it. It's probably, it, it's, it's, it's more of a high profile character than I, than, than I'm usually drawn to, but I just, uh, I got an idea for him and I just couldn't let it go. Um, so really all I, I, I used just the, the look in the name. I didn't really, uh, stick to any of the, uh, the storyline uh, that that they did, I uh, modified his look a little bit so he's not quite so Danny Kaye-ish. Uh, changed the character's name, and uh, and and gave him gave him superpowers. Uh, I'm, it's kind of a riff on 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 Jekyll and Hyde or or the Incredible Hulk, I guess. Whereas it's a character who transforms into an alternate version, both physically and emotionally, of himself that he can't control. So and, the, the alter ego is, a, is an older, heavier, balder guy who transforms into this, you know, younger, idealized version of himself who's trapped in a clown suit and, you know, has a, an arsenal of magical weapons that he pulls from the folds of his, of his jacket. So what would you say to the angry Danny Kay Facebook group that's going to come after <laughs> you? <laughs> I, I, I actually haven't thought of that. Okay. <laughs> you're, giving, you're giving people more reasons to be scared of clowns? <laughs> <laughs> only, ba- only the bad guys have to be afraid of this clown. <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys. I hope you found it worthwhile. I hope everybody that's viewing this uh, video found it worthwhile. Um, we love doing these at live shows, clearly. And um, we, we were glad that San Diego Comic-Con is giving us the opportunity to do this panel um, in the I mean, pandemic, thanks, Dave, in the thanks pandemic for putting this together. age. What's that? Yes. Thanks for putting this together, Dave. It's always fun getting a fun. To, to, to chat about these kinds of things with, with such a wonderful group of people. Yeah. yeah I agree. This was a great time. One, one of the, well, I don't want to, yeah, we're, we're out of time, so I'm going to be quiet. So thank you very much, guys. Um, and thanks. hopefully you found your, your time worthwhile, and we will talk again soon. Cool. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks. thanks.